Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, first of all, we would like to congratulate you all on this auspicious day that is International Women's Day with the spirit that we and you will keep moving and keep doing the good work and this motive of reaching to you with the help of higher education will be completed. So dear friends, you are requested to be with us always as we promise to be with you always. So friends, once again, I will welcome you all in this session of ours today we are going to talk uh, on our series uh, on Indian writing in uh, English translation and um, under the series we are going to talk uh, on short fiction in post-independence India and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Professor Anand Prakash. Professor Anand Prakash is retired professor of English. Um, professor Prakash is a dynamic uh, professor who believes in giving his most of his knowledge to you. So friends we believe that today also you are going to be enlightened by him. So, we would like to welcome our guest, Professor Anand Prakash, once again. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you, Geetika, for your kind words and uh, welcome viewers. And uh, before I begin the discussion, uh, let me also wish all of you a uh, happy, you know, Women, Women's Day today. Uh, this is the day, you know, when we recognize that uh, there's a kind of role, a very significant role that women are supposed to play. And they do it so well these days because a large number of them today are educated. Anyway, uh, I'll not dwell on this. <clears throat> Already the wishes have been uh, sent to you, um, given to you by our able uh, anchor. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the discussion today, as has been already announced, is on short fiction in post-independence India. And uh, I particularly focus here on the short fiction because that's a mode that's the literary mode, you know, that uh, is very popular in India. And it has been popular in India since time immemorial, uh, 3,000 years, still more than that. There were people who told short stories, who told stories. And in fact, we have books, already this has been mentioned in many other discussions. We have books, you know, which uh, give you knowledge of politics and philosophy through stories. Panjitantra is one example where uh, a kind of uh, educational program is conducted through the telling of the short story. Anyway, I wouldn't dwell on that. Uh, in the contemporary time, that is post-independence, which, which starts from 1947 and continues, uh, <clears throat> short fiction has uh, gone through uh, some evolution and uh, it has taken off from where Premchand, for instance, left it uh, in, nine, in the 1930s when he breathed his last. And uh, he left a whole tradition of uh, short story writing then. The number of short stories that Premchand wrote uh, amounts to about 300. And in these stories, he always tells a message. So short story is a, a method of communicating to the reader uh, the knowledge about society in which the reader lives, or the knowledge about the society in which the writer lived when he or she wrote. And uh, this knowledge uh, takes many forms in, in, in the short story. It might, you know, take uh, the example of uh, the message at the end. That message uh, may be, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, symbolized or represented through certain characters, certain direct statements, the attitude of the author. And, uh, well, if one goes into the aesthetics of short story, aesthetic means, uh, you know, the kind of uh, notion of beauty that short stories have, uh, short stories entertain us, short stories give us pleasure, they, they, they give us a kind of satisfaction. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, in a, a heightened, excited state of mind, uh, excited state of mind. And uh, this aesthetic aspect uh, also goes parallel to what the story does in terms of communicating knowledge. So, uh, short fiction is that kind of a fiction and uh, in, the in the 1947 onwards, uh, it, it uh, as I said earlier, uh, went into uh, a kind of uh, evolutionary mode. Uh, so far as the uh, so, uh, time uh, segment of, of this short story writing is concerned, uh, let me tell you that when India becomes free, then writers also become free. They also, you know, uh, are not bound by the literary, social, political conventions uh, that, you know, uh, kept them restrained from expressing themselves clearly. In 1947 onwards, India becomes free. It ceases to be a colony. 
it becomes a free country, its citizens are free, they are equal, and, and they can say whatever they want to uh, through the short story as, as, as they write it. And uh, the first expression of this new kind of a short story that India will now write about would be about the Indian reality with that sense of self-assurance. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that I'll later on uh, you know, <clears throat> talk in some detail also is that the short story is going to experiment itself uh, you know, with respect to communication. It will not communicate in that simple, apparently simple manner uh, in which you know, uh, Prem uh, at that point of time wrote. Uh, there will be experimentation on the part of the writers now in 1947 onwards. And in fact, uh, in the 1950s onwards, there will be uh, within the short story, uh, writing and appreciation. Writing when you write a short story, appreciation when people talk about it. In both the cases, there is a word, new word, uh, the, the word has come and that word is new. So uh, in India, in the 1950s particularly, uh, there will be a new short story. What that new is, the, the, that uh, I'll uh, come um, as, as, uh, as, as uh, you know, the argument, uh, you know, uh, uh, assists me uh, for, for, for this purpose. So uh, let me tell you that, uh, and I repeat, that a short story is an important mode. Every writer, you know, wants to have an audience and one of the best ways to ensure that one has an audience is to write a short story, a novel or a short story particularly short story because short story is by definition short. You can read a short story in one sitting. Uh, it, it would take between 10 minutes and 30, 35 minutes. And we can always you know, have that kind of a time where you start a short story, you read it, you enjoy it, and then you uh, move on to do other things during the day. Uh, <clears throat> so it's an important mode in that sense. What are the new emphases that uh, the story of the post-independence period uh, you know, uh, gives uh, to, 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 the, to the topics. What are the emphases? What is the point, you know, that is emphasized? What is it, you know, that, that is held important by the writer and by the writing? So, uh, well, one is psychology. In the national movement, people were aware of psychology. They were aware of what went on in the mind of the human being uh, when one, you know, uh, decided to say something or not to say something or when the human being felt. Something went on in one's mind all the time. But uh, short story did not, at that point of time, give much credence to this kind of psychological uh, reality. Because the writer's job at that point of time was to provide models of behavior to the, to the audience, to the, to the readers. And therefore, uh, what the reader wanted to become, or should want to become, that was uh, the aim of the writer to present. The, the, the writer would present a role model for most of the readers of the short story. So when you present a role model, then you uh, present that person, that, that character, uh, you know, as, as, as enlightened, as, as an idealist, as a person who uh, holds society uh, higher than oneself, uh, when, uh, you know, the, the person is supposed to uh, play a role so that, you know, the, the country uh, gains in uh, confidence to uh, assert their right to live, they assert their right to think and, and, and to behave against the colonizer. So most of the focus would be either on the daring and courage of the uh, uh, characters or on the behavior, restrictive behavior of the uh, imperialist uh, forces in the country. So there was no time for the writers at that time to go into what I call psychology. But as the country becomes free, people uh, now, now can you know, uh, hold themselves on. And uh, when, when they say something, they can be uh, a bit more con cognizant about what the implications might be, uh, not, not just for the, for the reader, but also for the writer, uh, for, for, for the community to which one belongs and all those things. So uh, the writer became then somewhat oriented towards self. So the self, I, I as a writer for instance, would like to talk about myself, how I decide how I choose uh, certain things, what is my moral, uh, you know, uh, stance. Is that moral stance, you know, viable? Uh, is that workable? Uh, should I hold it? Should it not, uh, would it not uh, restrict others, you know, if, if they hold the same thing? Or, if, or would not, would not my, my morality clash with somebody else's morality? So when I go into this question, then I'm going into my own mind. So 
characters in the short stories and even the writing as a whole also became oriented towards this kind of a thought, uh, which I also can call subjectivity. So this, the, the writing, the short story in the 1950s becomes uh, conscious about the subjectivity, the person, the subject. And it's not uh, you know, as, as much uh, uh, emphasizing what can be called objectivity, that is the world outside, not the person, but the uh, society uh, the, 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 that the person faces. So uh, psychology is important. So you know that uh, in the uh, uh, early 20th century in Europe, and particularly in England, uh, there were people who would uh, talk mostly about the mind. There are writers like you know, James Joyce in the uh, uh, 1910s and 1920s, and uh, these writers would uh, allow characters never or seldom to come out of themselves. So whatever I think, that should be always given. So I, I think this, then that uh, leads me to another thing. Then there's a third issue, then there's a fourth subject, then there's a fifth thing. And all the time I'm uh, traveling you know, in, in my imagination, uh, through my memory. Uh, suppose I'm a 30-year-old person, then I'd go back to the time when I was 20 or, or, or to the time when I was 10. Uh, the kind of time I spent, the first day I went to the school, the kind of teachers I met, all these things, you know, I keep in memory as, as, a, as a person. So the writer, uh, uh, this James Joyce, who was a great writer of the early 20th century, he would, you know, uh, pick up characters who would live in their mind. So they, they, became, they had become famous by the time India became free, 1947. And uh, uh, Fried, of course, was uh, towards the end of the 19th century uh, and the 20th century. So uh, Fried uh, also offered you know, a, 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 a different kind of an answer to the problems of life. And uh, Fried was all the time emphasizing the mind. So this psychology uh, was picked up now in the uh, 1950s as a discipline, as an approach, as an attitude that would affect the uh, characters and the writer. So uh, psychological dimension. The second thing would be existentialism. I, I hope you have heard this word. It's, it's a very popular word these days in criticism and in philosophical thought. But you know, uh, when a writer becomes an existentialist, then that writing, uh, in my opinion, uh, becomes strengthened by what I call sense of reality or authenticity. Because uh, if you talk of existence, existence means life, the way I live it, then you know you'll talk talk about you you'll be compared to talk about the daily life, the actual situation, the people who participate in the, participate in the situation, and the person or persons who are becoming aware of the impact of the immediate reality on their minds. So uh, I, I have an experience, and that experience is multifaceted. It, it has many dimensions, it has many aspects, and I would like to present all of them in detail in a manner that I saw, in a manner that I witnessed the, 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 uh, the experience. So that is called existentialism. I will not go beyond it. I will talk about what I felt and why I felt, and uh, the way particularly that different you know, pressures impinged on my mind. So this is existentialism. Uh, when I talk about pain, when I talk about restrictions, when I talk about compulsions, uh, when I talk about you know certain areas which are uh, forbidden, which are prohibited, but I still talk about them because they occur in my mind and they are there in society. So people became, uh, in, in the, the trend came from the West, but then in the, in the 1950s, writers also started talking about, talking in terms of what can be called existentialism. So, so they would talk about their existence, the way they lived. And uh, if that is the starting point that the writer talks about the way one lives, then you know there is a tremendous difference that the short story makes. I told you in the beginning of the discussion that short story was generally educative. But this story, that, that, that will be existentialist, will not be educative. Because the writer is not telling you what to do. The writer is only saying that this is what he actually saw. This is what he actually went through. This is what the pain was. He felt this pain and he is sharing it with you. You may, or, you may or may not accept the pain, you may reject the pain, you may say, well, this is a waste of time and I will not have this kind of pain in my own life, I never had it, so why should I agree? So that kind of a thing the reader can say. But so far as the writer is concerned, the writer says, okay, you have your opinion, but this is what I saw, this is what I felt, and here I write in this manner. So a short story in the 1950s becomes existentialist in nature. First, 
psychological, second existentialist. The third thing is that the writer uh, is now also thinking of the form of the short story. How should the short story begin? How should it develop? How should it end? Should it end at all? All these questions the writer is conscious about, which the writer was not conscious about earlier. The writer would simply tell the story. Uh, you know, the story form, as, as, as is clear to all of you, all of us, is that although always the grandparents tell the short story. Children always, you know, uh, uh, gather around uh, the nani or, or the dadi and say, okay, grandma, give a short, short story. And the grandma has to give a short story. And, and uh, then, you know, a short story has a beginning and then the right, uh, children are very happy to hear, you know, that this is what actually happened at that time. So they, their imagination is quickened. Their imagination is affected and they like it. So that was the original short story form. But in the 20th, 20th century, in the 1950s, this kind of form was uh, somewhat abdicated, was, was, was stopped, was left. And people started saying, what kind of a short story should I write? Where should I begin? Should I begin in the middle? Should I give uh, in the short story an account of an incident? Or should I talk about experience? When I talk about experience, should it be my experience or my neighbor's experience? Uh, is, is the neighbor's experience clear to me? I ask myself as a writer. Suppose I, 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 I as a male, uh, take the character of a woman in the short story uh, and I say, this is how the woman felt. How do I know how, uh, the, the way a woman, woman feels? The, the writer doesn't know because the writer is a male. So, you know, these, these questions about the form, that you cannot write about a character whom you don't know. You don't know a woman, you don't know a poor person. Suppose you are a rich man and you want to write a short story about poverty. You cannot write because you have not seen poverty. So, you know, then you will write a different kind of a short story. So, which will be, in the, you know, that when you write a short story, you will be thinking about your own experience. Therefore, the word authentic became very important in the short story in the, uh, you know, uh, 1950s onwards. So, uh, these are the emphases that the, the, the short story experiments with. It also talks about itself. It, it also talks about the form. It talks about uh, dialogue should be used or not. Characterization should happen or not. Should the short story be in the first person singular? First person singular is that I talk about myself. I say, okay, and, uh, I, I went there and, and I saw some problem and I could not solve it, so I helped. And so it, all, all across the short story, there's the use of the I. So this kind of a short story will definitely tell the reader that the person has seen it. That's why he's using the word I. So these experiments in the short story happened at that time. Does it apply to all the Indian writing of, of the 1950s? This is the question you might ask. This is the question I ask from myself. That what I am telling you about psychology, existentialism, and form, was it the case with Hindi? Was it the case with Gujarati? Was it the case with Bengali? Was it the case with Tamil and Telugu and Kannada and Malayalam? I ask this question. What's the answer? Please think about the answer. So far as I'm concerned, the answer is that India in the 1950s is integrated into a nation. Already it has become a nation because as a nation they fought British imperialism. If British imperialism had been there and we were not united under the idea of nationhood, we wouldn't have been able to fight. So already there was a nation. And this nation suggests to us that all regions of the country now will be educated. There will be more and more of education. And with education, middle classes all across the country will happen. So in fact, 19, uh, 1950s is the period when schools and colleges are opened on a grand scale in the country. Almost every village, if not every village, every second village has a primary school in, in, in the 1950s. Then there is a college in an area. Then there, is a, then there are many colleges in an area. Then there, there, there are many colleges in a city. So the, you see, this kind of expansion of education in the 1950s occurs. 1950s occurs. And when this occurs, then from 1950 to 1960, you will see such a great expansion of education that uh, the, the number of uh, people who are educated uh, will increase further. And then there will be jobs also because industrial base in the country also is increasing. What am I saying? I am saying that with this, the middle class will appear, will, ex will, will, will come up, will emerge in the whole country. And if the middle class appears in the whole country, then psychology, existentialism, and experiment with form will definitely come to writers everywhere. So you will find that 
uh, the uh, new short story will be there in all the languages. It is there in Punjabi, it is there in Gujarati, it is there in Marathi, everywhere because the middle class is now growing and they are producing writers who will write a short story of the kind that I have mentioned. Anyway, uh, <coughs> middle, the job of the middle class, I am a middle class person, I have been a teacher. Uh, many of you uh, are teachers or, or would be teachers later. Many of you would join the government jobs. Many others would join private jobs in which mind is utilized. Which means that this job of the mind, this, this job of you know uh, putting together uh, your resources in such a manner that mind is involved, this will create the middle class consciousness in all of us. So when that is the case, then short stories also would be of the consciousness kind. They will also create a sense of consciousness. So there will be characters who will be aware of themselves. The, 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 they will have what is called a sense of uh, identity. What is identity? Identity is not merely a subject of identity card, I card. Identity also means who I am. And in fact, in the I card also, you always uh, identify yourself as a person. You, you present your photograph and say, this is me, this is my picture. And then you say, this is my name. And when your name also does not tell you the, the exact identity, then this is my father's name. And uh, further, this is my address. This is my education. So all these things come under your identity. And uh, this, this is the identity in the raw form. But then somebody can also ask a question from you and from me. And the question is, what do you think about society? And when you say, I think this about society, the society is good, it's going to be better, or it's bad and it's going to be worse, whatever you say, that is a part of your consciousness and that is a part of your identity. So this identity is an issue as to who you are, who I am. This becomes important in the 1950s. Nobody would ask these questions in the 1920s. Uh, very few would be asking these questions because most of them were busy. Either they were not educated or they were educated, then they would be thinking about the you know, rule of another country. And uh, there was no time for uh, the, these issues uh, to, to be raised in a, in, a, in a big manner. But in the 1950s, people started talking about their identity. This is what I am. The, 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 and of course, these days, uh, the, the, there are issues you know, which are coming up in, in, in the name of identity. And uh, there is a whole politics that is there about identity. But then, so far as identity as a philosophical concept is concerned, that happened in the 1950s onwards. <clears throat> then you know, uh, <clears throat> look at the short story uh, of the pre-independence period and compare it with the short story that came up in the uh, post-independence period. And you will realize that in the pre-independence period, most of the short stories are about villages, they are about peasants, that they are about you know, production on the fields, that they are, they are about uh, irrigation. Most of the uh, lit literary forms refer to the village experience. Uh, Prem Chand is a writer of villages. Tagore has a large number of uh, short stories and novels, you know, which, which are there either of the small town or the village. But then in the 1950s, the life in the urban areas, life in the small towns and big towns, that also is going to be important. So uh, one of the important themes of the short story in the 1950s would be somebody gets a job, the job is away from where one lives, so one leaves the place. And if one leaves the place and if the person is single, is unmarried, then this person will go to the city. There he will face problems of identity, who he is, which, which village he is from. And then, you know, he, he might, you know, uh, also come in, come in contact with other people. And these other people, uh, you know, uh, sometimes are women or sometimes they, they, are, they are men, you know, with young sisters. And everybody is thinking of, you know, marrying off uh, uh, one's sisters or um, arranging a marriage of one's brother. So the question of mixing up with people, having friendship, having love, having marriage in mind, this becomes an important issue. This is not an important issue in the pre-independence period. So uh, this way, the middle class starts you know, raising cultural questions of a different kind in the 1950s. So you will find you know, that uh, in, in the 1950s, uh, a large number of stories will talk about either a successful love or a failed love. If it's a failed love, then there will be anger, there will be frustration, there will be a sense of loss, there will be a sense of sadness. So short stories will talk about this sadness. And how do you express sadness? In a short story, how does one express about sadness? You can talk about a sad experience, that's one way. But then 
uh, within the short story, you may also have to uh, give an account of what sadness is. How do you feel when you are sad? How do I feel when I am sad? So, this becomes a very important issue and a very interesting issue for us to consider. Should we have in the new short story that I am talking about in the 1950s, characters and characterization? Should we have a large number of characters in a short story? Why, why do I raise this question? I raise it because in, in Premchand's short stories and in uh, short stories written by Premchand's contemporaries, there are a large number of characters. And Premchand does not have the time, you know, to go into each character. But then he is able to relate the characters and put them in a situation where they interact with one another. In the 1950s, this is not the case. People are not picking up many characters at that point of time. They are, they are only picking up one or two characters who are at the center of it. And uh, there, you know, they are, they are presenting them. So, there will be fewer characters then. Should the writer characterize them also? Characterize means? What does characterize mean? Characterize means, you know, that you will present a character uh, in, in a manner that he or she would look different from other characters. That is called characterization. Your special features, they are your characterization. So, uh, in the new short story, there will be uh, a weaker characterization than was the case with writing in Premchand's time. So, you will have fewer characters then. This is the impact you know, the, the, that uh, the new short story uh, bears from life and uh, under which uh, impact, you know, it invents new methods to communicate uh, itself. So, I have given a kind of a statement about the short story and this applies to all languages in India. I will pick up one or two uh, languages in, in the second part of the discussion and I uh, will make a few more points regarding this general thing because this is what the short story is. And uh, you know, this is how one can finally reach uh, a tentative conclusion regarding what the short story was in the or, or has been in the uh, last 50 or 60 years. Thank you. Well, this one, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us uh, uh, this uh, session. And uh, we believe that all the friends who might be watching us would have uh, gathered lots of information. So, friends, you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to the session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on uh, uh, short fiction in post-independence India and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios, Professor Anand Prakash. Dear friends, Professor Prakash is an eminent professor and uh, we believe that through him we get lots and lots of uh, knowledge. So, let's welcome our guest Professor Prakash once again and uh, let's be enlightened once again. Hello sir, welcome to the lecture. Thank you, Kritika. And uh, already we have covered some general features uh, of the short story that emerged in India uh, in the 1950s onwards. And uh, I, I used the word evolution in the beginning of the discussion. And uh, then I, I, I gave some factors, you know, that are connected with the evolution of the short story in the uh, post-independence period. Uh, I've talked about I, I've talked about psychology. I talked about existentialism. I talked about experiment with form. And uh, then I go further than this 
uh, here. And uh, I'll be taking some examples towards the end of the discussion from um, two other languages than, 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 than Hindi, because Hindi we have covered earlier uh, rather extensively. Uh, so un under this scheme, uh, I uh, you know, uh, take up finally th th this point about uh, literature, short fiction literature in the 1950s being affected by the cultural considerations of the time. This I have not uh, touched so far. Uh, I was talking about themes, but now uh, the writer was aware that there were certain pressures on him or her. And uh, these pressures, you know, came from the, the structure uh, that, that surrounded the writer. And the structure was not merely, you know, of the, of the town, of the city where one lived, uh, but also of the, of, of, the, of the entire country. And more than the country, of the world that surrounds the country. These structures were there. These structures were cultural, they were ideological. And when I say ideological, then I mean that there are certain areas of life where you know, ideas start affecting our understanding. And uh, writers always uh, d discuss ideas and uh, impact of ideas on understanding. Therefore, the pressures are there. And one pressure, for instance, is that you have to uh, publish a short story. And uh, if you publish a short story, then this should please the editor. This should please the publisher, otherwise the publisher will not, will, will not accept the short story. The editor will not accept the short story. So if you are guided by the liking or the preference of the editor or the publisher, then your freedom is restricted. And your writing also is influenced. Because then you are not writing what you want to write. You are writing keeping in mind the demand of uh, your, 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 your writing. Uh, the demand of the editor, the demand of the uh, publisher. And uh, if you want to have an award, win an award, if you want to appeal to more people, then you have to always remain circumspect, uh, clear, aware, alert, so that you know uh, your story, your short story is uh, accepted by the person you know who decides its fate so far as the publication is concerned. So uh, one pressure that the short story uh, had to bear, uh, you know, uh, on its pulse at that point of time was uh, writing not being directly connected with life. Isn't it a strange thing that literature is supposed to be holding a mirror up to life, should be reflecting life. This literature now is expected to talk only about itself, but not about the world around it. But this was the case. And uh, I call it, in the, as, as, as a critic, as, as a person who, who has read criticism and who has, uh, you know, uh, also been in touch with other writers uh, in, in the country, as, as that kind of a person, I, I know that uh, the, the, the writers at that point of time uh, had to all the time think about the characters and their world, but not about your world, my world. And though, so within, the, within the short story, uh, one had to think only about the requirements of the tale, of the narrative, of the experience, but nothing outside. So the short story would not be ideological, short story would be always experience based. It will not express an opinion. The characters will not express an opinion, they will only say what they felt. And if they went outside the, opin uh, outside the feeling, outside the experience and started saying what they believe in, then the editor, the publisher, the others will not be happy. You say this is not literature, this is politics, this is philosophy, this is economics. But this is so you could not even talk about poverty, because if you talked about poverty, then you are going into the area of, of, of economics or politics. So this kind of pressure was there in the 1950s and 60s, because of which writers started talking about. Uh, I touched upon this, uh, you know, earlier also about the form. So they, they wanted to change the form. The form will be always restricted to feeling and experience. So this is uh, one thing, you know, that, that this was a problem. Uh, I have not, uh, you know, shown it earlier as a problem in the, in the previous part of the discussion. But then, now I, now, now I say that the writers were living under certain constraints, certain pressures. The, uh, that writing has to be writing alone and confined uh, and should be confined to itself, then to the outside pressures. This other thing was that objective reality also was, uh, you know, not allowed, was disallowed. You could not talk about the reality as objective. You would also, also always say, 
I saw it, I felt it, I may be wrong. So the word I became very important in the short story, which was not the case earlier. This I, uh, you know, uh, said through the use of the word subjective and subjectivity became the issue. The writer would always refer to oneself. Distancing from ideas and politics, this I referred to, this became the norm in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, one had only to talk about the states of mind, sadness, happiness, frustration, bitterness, anguish. These were the things, you know, that, 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 that would be the, the staple of short stories, but not things like, well, I don't agree. You, had, you, 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 uh, you don't have to say that you don't agree. You don't have to say that you agree. You only say, this is what I feel. This is the kind of pressure that was there, because of which a large number of writers in the 1960s and 70s, they became angry with structures. They became angry with pressures. They became angry with society. Many of them started calling themselves angry men, angry women, angry people. Uh, literature was supposed to be called at that time angry writing, angry literature. And uh, in fact, people were so very angry as writers in the 1960s and 70s that they, they started using terms such as anti-poetry, anti-short story. So you, you ask a writer to write a short story and the person says, I'm writing an anti-short story. In, in Hindi, too, it was called Akahani. Uh, and uh, and in, in poetry, it was called Akavita. It's not Kavita. It's, it's not Kahani. So th that kind of anger, you know, also, uh, also emerged because of which uh, the experimentation in short stories took a very negative turn. Earlier it was a positive thing, short story is always positive. Short story is always supposed to, uh, you know, give us happiness and, and give us a sense of bliss. But uh, this uh, akavita or akahani or anti-story or anti-poetry, this became a subject of, of a different kind. So instead of tastefulness, people started talking about distaste. If, if, if something, you know, uh, made you disgusted, then they will talk about this disgust. This idea was not, uh, uh, you know, uh, exclusive to India. This was there also in the case of Europe, where, where they talked about, in fact, absurdity. In the 1950s and 60s, in France and England, a, a, a movement started, and that was the movement of the absurd. Absurd means it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make any sense. So people started using uh, a lack of sense, a lack of consistency, as some kind of a norm, as some, some kind of a virtue in literature. And uh, that was because the structures were uh, putting pressure on the writer to say only those things which were palatable to the powers that be. And writers said, we will not be a part of this and therefore we will not use any form of writing. So short story became a negation of short story in the 1960s and 70s. For instance, if a short story has not to be a short story, what does it mean? This is the question one should, one should think of. If, the, if, if, it, if, there is a, if a short story is not a short story, then okay, it's a poem. So write a poem uh, under, under the name short story. And how do you write a poem under the name of short story? You can't write verses, you can't write, you know, uh, meter, you cannot write chanda. So how will you write a short story if you, if you don't use the form? Then they said, okay, we'll use symbols. We'll use, you know, uh, uh, big words only and we'll use pictures, word pictures, but we'll not uh, give characters. So there'll be no account of any, any incident. So short stories will become inc incident free. There'll, there'll, no, there'll be no ghatna there, no, no, no incident. There'll be only situation and the situation also will not be named. So uh, uh, sometimes one, one feels lost. So how does one feel lost and how does one say that one is lost? You can always, you know, uh, say things in such a manner that one thing does not connect with another. And if one thing does not connect with connect, uh, another, like you say, Ke main hu, I, I'm, I'm thirsty and therefore I will sleep. The two things don't make sense together. How can you sleep if, if you are thirsty? But then this kind of a thing started happening in short story and in other writings. And uh, uh, this kind of a short story was there in, in Bengal, it was there in Punjab, it was there in Hindi. It was there in other languages. Uh, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a, a pan-Indian phenomenon. Why? I, I gave the reason earlier and I said that every region in 1950s and 60s in India has a middle class coming up. And this middle class is uh, interacting with one another through translation. 
and sometimes through English. And uh, they, they are also open now uh, through the cultural window, uh, open to the, the rest of the world. So there also the same mood is occurring. And uh, we as critics, uh, you know, would, would, would be always uh, going into the reasons as to why it happened. And one reason given about the short story and, and about other things was that in fact, uh, life does not allow us to give a narrative. Narrative means a, a, a story. So no story is possible now. Because a story means that there is some kind of a connection between one thing and another. But there is no connection now. So how do you write a narrative? So in a way, then you know, criticism realized that uh, everybody was angry or disgusted or disappointed or disillusioned because of the conditions that the Second World War left us with. So they started you know, uh, connecting uh, and, and writers uh, are, are imaginative people so, so they can connect uh, things with a bigger event like the World War. The Second World War had just ended in 1945 and uh, India became free in 1947 and uh, uh, the memory of the World War, Second World War was clear in the minds of a large number of writers in the 1950s and 60s. They had, they, had, they had gone through the experience of war indirectly at least, if not directly, uh, you know, when the war occurred from between 1939 and 1945. So those people who were 20 years then would be uh, 35 in nine, uh, 1955 uh, 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 and so on and so forth. So when they were 50, it would be 1970 and things like that. So that way I say that uh, the uh, impact of the world war happened on uh, the middle classes in India at that point of time and they were so frustrated and without any answers that they started negating the very form of the short story and uh, went into uh, uh, a kind of disgust, a kind of distaste that I have talked about. <coughs> then you know, uh, <coughs> some new emphases occur in the short story in the 1980s and 90s. I've so far, you know, I've talked about 50s and 60s and now, now 70s, but then new themes, new, new references, new, new questions, new subjects, they appeared on the scene. How, how you know, in history, uh, these subjects were not there less 50 years before this. Why do they happen in 1980, 1990? And the, the writers live, you know, uh, from day to day, from moment to moment, and they read newspapers, they, they, they see television in 1980. Television is a strong force in 1980, then 1990 comes and uh, uh, there is a lot of politics in the country and the politics is always for the good because through politics you evolve as a, as a citizen. So people are now taking interest in politics also and uh, there is for instance a new idea called social oppression. Earlier it was economic exploitation, now it is social oppression. There are certain sections of society which you know uh, are powerful because they have money. And uh, because of money, they also have prejudices. So social prejudice also becomes an important factor. In the 1980s and 90s, for instance, the, the way these words are very important in, in the 1980s. The word called subaltern. This word was not there uh, uh, when I was doing my MA in 1965. The word was not there. But subaltern became a very important word in 1970 and 1980. What is subaltern? Subaltern means the lower sections. So there are lower sections in the, in, in the city, there are lower sections in the towns, there are lower sections in the villages, <coughs> there are poor peasants, there are people who are, who are uh, economically landless agricultural laborer. They are there. And because they are poor, therefore people hate them. And hate them, why? Because they stink, they smell. And why do they stink and smell? Because they, they don't have water enough to clean themselves. There's not enough water even to drink. So you know, all these problems regarding uh, new questions, these emerged, you know, in the 1980s and 90s and uh, one can say that the short story, which was earlier, I talked about the short story as an anti-story, this became a short story with a vengeance. Yes, I'll write a short story. I'll write a short story about 1980. I'll write a short story about social prejudice. A very important impact of, and uh, I think uh, we, we began the lecture very well, uh, with reference to the Women's Day, in 1980 and 1990s, feminism becomes a very important issue. Why? Because by 1980 and 1990, a, a large number of women who were born after independence, these women have been to school and they are now working in offices. And if they are working in offices, then of course they, they can't observe a parda. Then they will be talking to men. Sometimes there are women officers. 
and if there are women officers and male subordinates, then the entire equation between man and woman changes. The, 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 the subordinate male would not be very happy to, you know, uh, take orders from a woman who is an officer. So this kind of a thing will also come into effect, so far as the representation of life is concerned in the short story. The short stories became very feminist. In fact, uh, the, uh, the, the word, you know, in, in many languages, now is stri vimarsh. What, what is stri vimarsh? Stri vimarsh is women's discourse, feminist discourse. Because women now want to talk as women. There are certain problems that are peculiar to them. In, in marriage, for instance, they always play second fiddle. They, they have secondary role, not, not, not the primary role. Which school the, 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 the child will go to, which education the child will have, this question is decided largely by the males. But the uh, woman who is a young woman in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, this woman would say, I'll take this decision. Why? Because I'm also earning money. This is my child also. And the career of the child will depend on what I say. And there, there are clashes. And if there are clashes, who is right? <coughs> I as a writer, I, I as a thinker, I, I, I as a teacher uh, can say, okay, I, I'll, I'll do this. But another person who is a woman who can say, no, no, you're wrong. So what do I do? And there's democracy in the country. All of us have a right to our opinion. So, you know, these issues in the 1980s and 90s, they start taking a different kind of shape. One shape is the subalterns, people who are lower down in scale, they also have the voting rights. They can change the governments. If that, that happens, if women can change the government, if, if ordinary people can, can take part in, in, in the political arena, and different political parties are now vying with one another in order to get the uh, you know, support from different sections of society. So, you see, literature is a living option. And in this literature, uh, these are the forces that have to be covered. The more forces you cover, the stronger you become as, as, a, as a writer and, and as a person, as a practitioner in literature. So this is what started happening in the 1980s and 90s. That was not the case earlier. <coughs> the, the latest example uh, is of, uh, you know, the, the world becoming unipolar. The world was not unipolar until 1990. There were two poles in the world. One pole, one pole was imperialism, capitalism, the other pole was socialism. But in 1990, Russia fell as a socialist country. And there's no other country that, that, that you know, could uh, uh, stand against imperialism in 1990s. And a new, new problem occurred that the, the, the imperialist center started attacking countries and the poor people, the poor countries, people, countries like us just didn't know what to do, where to go. So, you see, these, these issues, they were born by the short story. So, there are a large number of short stories in the 1980s and 90s, which uh, you know, used the flight of imagination. That you, you see, you go into an imagination area because reality doesn't allow, allow you to do anything. Therefore, you bring in imagination there. You start talking of a kite, you start talking of a snake, you start talking of a mountain, the mountain becomes big. And with the help of the mountain, you go to Mount Everest from there. You, 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 uh, that way, you are, you are bringing in elements, the mountain starts talking. <coughs> what do you do? This, this sky, you, the sky, the, there is a voice in the sky. And that voice resembles somebody, somebody you know, uh, somebody's grandfather. So what does one do? Uh, the voice of the grandfather. So what I'm saying is that uh, in short story, Particularly in, in uh, no, not this time uh, in, in, in central, central Europe, in, in, in developed Europe, not in America, no, no, not in England, but elsewhere, like in Spain, like in Latin American countries. A new kind of imagination developed and a new kind of short story, you know, is written there. What is that short story called? It's, it's uh, of course, realism, but then this is magic realism. So imagine. So, so the magic has become very important. Earlier, nobody would bother about magic. People would laugh at a musician and about magic. But in this time, uh, people will start saying, okay, this happened in magic. And I'll, I'll, I'm just talking in magic realism. Quite interesting. So I say that uh, uh, all these emphases of, of the post-independence period, these emphases have found a place, a significant place in the short fiction. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 I'll, I'll, now I have uh, now only a little time to discuss, you know, uh, these things, but I've given you a panoramic view uh, of the evolution of the short story in the, uh, I've attempted to give, uh, whether I've been able to clearly 
see or not is for you to decide. I will be uh, now, you know, towards the end of the discussion, I will give you <coughs> examples of two short stories. One I have picked up from Punjabi and the, the writer is the Sahit Academy Award winner, Gurdayal Singh. And uh, the, the story is available in English translation. It's titled The Season of No Return. And uh, this is a short story of a different kind and very fascinating. When I read the short story, then I realized, you know, that this kind of a short story is difficult to imagine. For instance, this, this, this short story doesn't have a villain. It doesn't have a bad person. Everybody is good. Everybody, but everybody is not happy. And in fact, there is a lot of, uh, you know, resentment. There, there's, there's resentment with self. Resentment with circumstance. But there, there is nothing you know, that, that can be easily identified. I like this story for this reason. Uh, there is a woman called Cory. Uh, I don't exactly know uh, whether Cory would be Cory. Or Cory would be you know, the, the gentleman who is called, uh, who's called Singh. So his wife is, is, is called Kaur in Punjab. So maybe it's that Kaur. I, 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 I tried to find out, but it was not indicated anywhere in the short story. Uh, and uh, she is the central character. It's an old woman. And uh, she uh, has to live with one or the other son. And uh, which son should she choose? The son who will uh, you know, keep her happy. But this son, you know, the, the elder son, he says, I, I, I would marry according to my choice. And the mother says, you can't marry according to your choice. You must marry in your equals. And he says, no, I like another woman. So he has married a woman from the lower, uh, you know, section of society. So uh, Cory does not like it. And uh, then uh, the, this, 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 this man, our, our son, he says, okay, come and live with us and live away from Punjab. So, uh, so this uh, lady, Cory, she goes with the elder son and his wife, this wife from the lower section, to live away from Punjab. And it's mentioned thousands of miles away from Punjab. So I was thinking as to what thousands of miles away from Punjab would mean. Then I thought maybe it's the southern part of India. So you have, you know, uh, a, a Punjab, uh, the memory of which the uh, old woman is carrying, but she is compelled to live away from her home. And when she goes there and live, the, man, the, na the name of the place is not mentioned. It is only said, you know, that <coughs> it's a, a foreign land. So foreign land could be maybe Tamil Nadu, maybe it could be Kerala, one doesn't know. But there is sea there and, and, and the, uh, the uh, sharp winter, the, 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 that winter is not there, no, 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 not very bad summer is there. So I could see it, it will be a town, you know, somewhere near the coast. And uh, then, you know, she, uh, she has all the comforts. But she doesn't like to live there. She wants to go back to Punjab and live with, you know, uh, the, that, that kind of life where there is very uh, strong winter and a very strong summer. So she, she has to go back. The, the son doesn't, uh, the son says, okay, you live with us, but she, she is not happy there. So finally, this is what the story says. Cory was stunned when she heard that her son had asked her to, uh, to, to go to Punjab and live there for some time. After a while, she thought of something and said, son, it's up to you. If you are finding it difficult, in the sense, you know, that uh, you, uh, you say that it's not uh, possible for you to send me, I won't mind staying a little longer. I can stay here if, if you want. So you see the woman, the woman is a, has an affection. She wants to live with the son, but she says, I'll go only if you ask. Otherwise, I'll stay here because I, I, I came for you. And, uh, you know, then the son finally is able to send the woman back. She can be, feel better there in, in Punjab and then the sun feels bad. So he says, it's so cold outside today. There was no cold on that day, but he says it's so cold. And the moment he reached home, he joined two blankets and put them over himself. You don't have to join two blankets in southern India, but he was feeling cold because the mother had left. After a long time when warmth had seeped inside his body, he felt a sudden lightness of being. This is how the story ends. What does the story say? I found it very powerful in the sense, you know, that everybody is good. Everybody wants to help the other person. Everybody is sensitive, but the person cannot relate to a new, new place. So the, the, the woman has to go back to Punjab because that is the place which she likes to live, 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 live in. So this, this is the kind of story. It, it has a mood. It has all good characters and yet there is a sense of sadness. So I, I, I thought that I should just talk about such a story. And this story could be written only in the 1960s, 60s or 70s. 
and by a writer who is a great humanist, who, who is not making any distinction between a villain and, 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 a, and an ideal person, a hero. He is saying everybody is good and yet there are problems in life and those problems relate to maybe the place. Where, where, where one has grown up and, 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 and gone up. There is a strong sense of nationalism also in the story. One likes one place, even if that place was bad in summer and bad in winter. This is one example. The other example uh, is of a Gujarati story written by a young woman. And uh, <coughs> her name is Ella Arab Mehta. She is from uh, Gujarat and she is written in Gujarati. And she lives in Bombay. And uh, her story is called in translation, it is called Bablu's Choice. Bablu is a boy. He is a boy of 15. And uh, he is going to take a new course now. A new subject. What subject is available to him? It is either a science subject or dancing. And the boy says, I want to learn dancing. And, and, and the father is very angry with him. He says, how can you learn dancing? Dancing is meant only for women, for girls. It is not for boys. And why do you behave as, 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 as a boy, you know, who, who has the taste of a girl? And the boy says, no, no, but I want to learn dancing. And he's very happy to, to, to learn dancing, but nobody allows him. And finally, he's compelled to take that course, the course of science, and he, has done, he does well there also. But then, this is how the story ends. Uh, somebody is talking to the audience in the school. There is a celebration. And, 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 and that celebration, you know, is that... Uh, the audience gave the old man a standing ovation. Bablu looked at Papaji, who was clapping the loudest, and thought, Father, you have set your daughters free, because there was a reference to women's freedom. But he's a boy, and he says, why do you keep your son in chains? I wanted to be uh, a dancer. It didn't allow me to be a dancer. And uh, the women will be uh, becoming engineers, so I can also dance. So this kind of a story, now, now see that this story is written in today's India. This story is written, let's say, in 2010. And this story, uh, 2005, I think it would be written around that time. Anyway, that's not important. It's a contemporary story. But then the roles are changing. Women are becoming, uh, you know, strong. Men also are becoming strong. But then, then they want to become more, more subtle, more, more sensitive. They are not allowed to. It's a very strange kind of a story. And I thought that uh, India has... Uh, such writers, you know, who can go into different directions and use their, their freedom to give preferences that are after their heart. So this way, one has stories and one has lots of ideas about the stories. With this, I come to the end. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us this precious session on uh, the short uh, fiction. And uh, friends, we believe that uh, if you have any queries or feedback, then you must write to us at info.cec at nic.in. The lecture is going to be uploaded on YouTube soon. So keep watching us and keep writing us. We would be meeting again tomorrow and would be discussing on another topic. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again.